Hello, I'm Richard Clay, and I'm the president and CEO of the Filson Historical Society. I'm so glad that you were able to join us for tonight's lecture. I understand that we have somewhere between 180 and 200 people tuning in tonight to watch this. Now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Stuart W. Sanders is the author of four books, including Murder on the Ohio Bell, Perryville Under Fire, the aftermath of Kentucky's largest Civil War battle, the Battle of Mill Springs, Kentucky, and Maney's Confederate Brigade at the Battle of Perryville. He's written for a wide variety of journals, magazines, and anthologies, and is the former executive director of the Perryville Battle Preservation Association. He is now the history advocate for our friends at the Kentucky Historical Society, He's a graduate of Center College, and in 2018, he gave the commencement address and received an honorary degree from that distinguished institution. I'll now turn the program over to Stuart, and then I'll rejoin after his presentation to moderate questions in the chat room as time permits. Thank you. We're mighty glad all of you are here. Well, Dick, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, I really appreciate that. And uh, a special thanks to the staff of the Filson Historical Society and to uh, Scott, Scarborough, Scott Scarborough in particular for helping uh, with the technical aspects of tonight's presentation. And it's great to see here. I, I can see a lot of your names. Uh, I see some coworkers. I see some friends. And uh, I think I also see my father's college roommate on here as well, which is uh, a lot of fun for me too. But um, I want to start by saying um, I'm personally, I am a member of the Filson, uh, even though I live closer to Lexington. I do value the Filson's uh, statewide impact, their regional impact, and the importance that this organization has. So uh, for those of you who are fellow members, um, during this time of COVID-19 where we have declining revenues and canceled programs, uh, um, I'm very appreciative of your support of this organization, the Kentucky Historical Society, and other organizations. Uh, I'm going to begin my uh, to share my screen now, and uh, then I'll begin to tell you about murders that took place on the steamboat Ohio Bell. So I, a few years ago, when I was researching another book project, I was uh, immersed in a series of online newspapers from 1856. And I stumbled upon an article that discussed a, uh, a, a dead man who'd been found floating in the Mississippi River tied to a chair. And this, of course, stopped me in my tracks as I was uh, scanning through the newspapers, and, and I wondered what, what had caused this man to be, to be bound and, and thrown into the river to suffer, and who was responsible for his horrific demise, and I immediately wanted to know what had happened to him, and I then put that other book project on hold and uh, began researching the story of this drowned man found in uh, the Mississippi River. The result of that research is my new book, Murder on the Ohio Bell. And the book examines two killings that took place in 1856 on board a Cincinnati-based steamboat that ran between New Orleans and Cincinnati, uh, dropping trade and passengers off at points in between. And I quickly realized that this story, which includes uh, the history of the steamboat, Ohio Bell, really went beyond the two murders. In addition to examining interpersonal violence and those two killings, the book also explores vigilante justice, Southern honor culture, the tensions that existed along the Ohio River border during the antebellum era, fugitive slaves, the Civil War, and much more. And tonight, I, I wanna tell you about how that man came to be thrown into the river tied to a chair. And I also will examine some of those larger themes and discuss how they affected life in the Ohio River Valley during the mid 19th century. But first, who was that drowned man and how did he meet that terrible fate? On March 14, 1856, the sidewheel steamer Ohio Bell arrived at the town of Smithland, Kentucky to pick up goods and passengers. And Smithland is located on the Ohio River near Paducah. And at the time, the, the boat was really a buzz about talk about Matilda Heron, who's pictured here, who was a famous actress who was on board the vessel. She was born in Ireland, she was raised in Pennsylvania, and uh, she'd gone to Europe and to London, England specifically to study acting. And while she was there in Europe, she 
really became enamored with a play called Camille, which was written by uh, Alexander Dumas, who we know as being the author of The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo. So while in Europe, Matilda Heron translated that play from French into English, and then she came back to the United States and spent the next several years um, performing Camille to rave reviews uh, up and down the Ohio and the Mississippi rivers. And Camille was a, a tragic love story about a courtesan who was dying of tuberculosis. And Heron really played that part with emotional dexterity and depth. It was said that people openly wept in the theater while she was performing uh, this part. And historians of the theater have credited her for really creating the emotional school of acting. Well, because of her fame, um, and while she was on board the Ohio Bell, only a handful of passengers noticed a ragged yet fashionably dressed Mississippian climb on board the Ohio Bell at Smithland. He said his name was J.B. Jones and that he was the son of a prominent planter from Holly Springs, Mississippi. Now, when, when Jones got on board 16 years later, one passenger actually remembered his appearance on the vessel. And this passenger wrote, when the steamer arrived, there came on board a man who was evidently recovering from a drinking spree. His clothes were of good material and fitted him well, though somewhat impaired by use. His face was soiled and his beard had grown to an uncomely length. His eyes were bloodshot and glared unnaturally. His linen needed a change. So Jones was rumpled, he had a highborn swagger, and even though it was before 11 a.m., he appeared to be intoxicated. And when he lurched on board the Ohio Bell, he presented himself as being a Southern gentleman of means. Now, residents of Smithland, Kentucky, uh, in addition to many communities up and down the Ohio River, um, would have been very familiar with the steamboat, the Ohio Bell. At least three vessels under that name uh, had plied the Cincinnati to New Orleans trade route since the late 1830s with one boat replacing the other. Uh, constructed in 1839, 1843, and 1855 respectively, each successive Ohio Bell increased in size as river passage became more important to the growth of the nation. Around that time in 1856, there were roughly 700 steamboats that were traveling on Western waters, including the third Ohio Bell. Now this image here actually shows the second Ohio Bell that was constructed in 1843. And this comes from an 1848 uh, panoramic image of Cincinnati um, that is now owned by the Cincinnati Public Library. And it's an incredible image that really shows what an Ohio River cityscape looked like during the 19th century. And it's available on their website. And, I, and you can really get good details of the steamboats and uh, the buildings that are along the shore. But um, this is what the Ohio Bell looked like in 1848. So although steamboat trade was very important to economic growth, and while these vessels allowed Cincinnati, Louisville, and other river towns to grow from the 1830s until the 1850s, this type of travel was not without risk. First of all, steamboats could run into snags and other underwater obstacles and sink. And since many 19th century Americans uh, did not know how to swim, a sinking steamboat was of course a, a terrifying and dangerous ordeal. Um, moreover, with each boat having massive furnaces and boilers on board to create steam for travel, the risk of fire or explosion was really ever present. And uh, this illustration that I'm showing here actually shows the explosion of the Alfred Thomas which blew up in Pennsylvania in 1860. And it was probably the result of a, a boiler explosion that happened. Um, these boilers were not always properly constructed and inconsistent metal strength, varying degrees of proper fabrication, and really little to no regulation overseeing safety standards led to horrific accidents. As historian Laura Davis explains, on average 21% of all antebellum river boats either burned or exploded. So again, about one fifth of these vessels either caught fire or blew up in a horrific fashion. This led to hundreds of deaths um, across Western waters. And uh, one of those casualties was actually uh, Mark Twain's brother, Henry Clemens, who died when the steamboat Pennsylvania exploded in June, 1858. So even though Twain was, uh, is remembered as being one of our greatest chroniclers of, of steamboat life in the 19th century, uh, the tragedy of steamboat travel actually hit very close to home to him. Because of fires, explosions, ice, other obstacles in the river, uh, most steamboats only survived on the Ohio and Mississippi rivers for an average of five years, um, which, is, which is fairly unbelievable. But uh, again, only five years uh, they tended to last. So the three boats that traveled under the name Ohio Bell from 1839 until the 1860s also faced the risk of fire, accident, and explosion. And although records are scant, it appears that the first Ohio Bell that was constructed in Cincinnati in 1839 
likely fell victim to a fire or a snag. Now the second Ohio Bell, which again is pictured here and which was part of a nationally significant fugitive slave case in 1845 that I described in the book, was likely destroyed in 1854. A replacement vessel, which was the third to bear the name Ohio Bell, was then constructed. And it was on that boat that was called an elegant passenger packet uh, that the intoxicated Mississippian J.B. Jones uh, boarded in March of 1856. Now when Jones arrived on board, he immediately went to the boat's saloon and began uh, downing liquor. And at approximately 11 a.m., while the vessel was between Smithland, Kentucky and Cairo, Illinois, Jones stumbled out of the saloon and went to the boat's barber for a shave. Now to pay, Jones gave the barber a $20 bill. The barber then went to the boat's clerk, who was a man named Hiram Stevens, to get change. Well, Stevens, who was a, a Cincinnati resident with a wife and four children, he'd spent most of his life on the river, examined the money and he proclaimed it to be a counterfeit bill and he refused to accept it. So the barber went back, uh, gave the return the bill to the Mississippian Jones and said that the money had been rejected. And the irritated Mississippi then handed over a $10 bill, but the clerk, Hiram Stevens, also returned that money saying that it too was counterfeit. Well, when Stevens rejected the money, the Mississippian became furious. One witness later said that, quote, the strange man flew, as it were, into a rage and rushed out of the barber shop in a wild and desperate manner, end quote. Jones found the clerk, Stevens, and asked him why he thought the bill was counterfeit. Stevens simply replied that he recognized the bill as a forgery. Well, Jones became more and more enraged at this, and he cursed and he screamed at the clerk. And a reporter later wrote that Jones, quote, paced the cabin, abusing the boat, and Stevens particularly using vile and improper language in the hearing of ladies, end quote. Now, Stevens told the Mississippian to calm down or else he would remove him from the cabin, but Jones kept ranting about this. Stevens then grabbed Jones's arm and told the Southerner that, quote, he had violated the rules of the boat, and then he walked him out of the cabin. Now, to Jones, who was the son of a Mississippi planter, this was indeed a grave offense. Stevens, who was a lower-class clerk, had put his hands on the upper-class Jones and had manhandled him out of the cabin. This insulted the Mississippian, this impugned his honor and impugned his manhood. And during the mid 19th century, the code of honor called for an immediate response when someone from a lower class insulted you. Therefore, Jones would not uh, challenge the clerk to a formal duel. Instead, the drunken Mississippian dealt with the affront immediately. Now, after Stevens escorted Jones out of the cabin, uh, the clerk Stevens told Jones that if Jones calmed down, they could resolve the issue. Jones, however, was in no mood for a compromise. Instead, he pulled a pistol from his pocket and he shot Stevens in the left side of his chest, just below the armpit. Stevens fell and he died in about 15 minutes. A Cincinnati newspaper wrote that Stevens, quote, was extensively known and beloved and respected in this community. And after shooting Stevens, Jones, the Mississippian, turned and ran. Jones's murder of Stevens really proved that the luxurious surroundings of the steamboat were not free from violence. Unsurprisingly, the shooting on the Ohio Bell was not an isolated incident. Instead, and as a reflection of 19th century society in general, Stevens' death was just one of many deadly acts perpetrated on Western waters. Like the general public, crew members and passengers could have a propensity for violence. In addition, the combination of alcohol and concealed weapons on board proved to be a volatile mix. Fights, shootings, stabbings, intentional drownings, Fatal beatings with firewood and other lethal episodes occurred despite the deluxe accommodations found on steamboats. Hostility between crew members could also lead to homicide. In 1846, for example, an engineer on the steamboat Ohio Mail bickered with a fireman before striking him with a piece of firewood. This knocked the fireman, a correspondent wrote, quote, against the furnace and burned him so severely as to cause his death yesterday morning in great agony, end quote. The engineer fled the scene when, it, when the boat arrived in Louisville. In 1859, a man named Owen Dennigan stabbed and killed John Moore, a fireman on the steamboat W.A. Violet. Dennigan then slipped off the boat and also escaped. Other perpetrators who tried to evade capture were not so fortunate. Again, in an era where uh, few people actually learned to swim, escaping from a moving steamboat was a dangerous proposition. In 1852, as the Yuba traveled from Cincinnati to New Orleans, a passenger became troublesome. In a scene very reminiscent of the murder on the Ohio Bell, watchman William Jenkins, who was essentially an onboard uh, security guard on the steamboat, took the traveler out of the cabin. 
the passenger promptly pulled a Bowie knife and stabbed Jenkins, killing him. The murderer then jumped overboard to escape and was found drowned in the river the next day. Well, back on the Ohio Bell, in shooting Stevens, the Mississippi Jones had made a terrible mistake. Not only had he killed a man on a steamboat with no way to escape except to jump overboard, but he had murdered a member of the crew. With a smoking revolver still in his hand, Jones raced up to the top deck, pursued by passengers and crew members. When the crew caught Jones, they knocked him to the ground and beat him severely. The scene soon became chaotic. Passengers crowded in, calling for Jones to be drowned or hanged. Others, however, wanted legal justice to prevail, and they begged for him to be taken to a town along the river for a trial. Finally, the justice minded on board prevented Jones' summary execution. And in fact, it was likely the famous actress, pictured here, Matilda Heron, who prevented a lynching. As soon as he was captured, a newspaper reported, one end of a strong rope was placed around his neck and preparations were rapidly made to string him up at the juncture. Miss Heron, the actress who was on board, appeared and she made a strong appeal to them on behalf of the young man and insisted upon their turning him over to the laws of the country to be dealt with. His execution was then abandoned. Matilda Heron was certainly well trained to make an emotional appeal, and in this case, it actually spared Jones from the vigilante's noose. Now, the pleas for those who called for justice were answered. Jones's life was spared. However, the Mississippian was not treated with kid gloves. The crew grabbed a rope to restrain him, and as we know, if anyone knew how to tie knots, it was sailors. They wrapped his entire body in a single rope, and a reporter later rep said that the cord was lashed, quote, across his mouth so tight that it stretched the corners of his mouth back considerably, cutting them so that the blood ran down his jaws and leaving him in the greatest agony. The crew would not lynch him at that time, but they would use their rope skills to make the murderer of their fellow crewmen suffer. They then took the bound killer below deck and left him tied to a chair near the engine room. Now at this point, Jones was actually one of the lucky ones. Lynching and shipboard justice was not uncommon on Western steamboats. Robbery, violence, and murder was not taken lightly, and crew members often took the law into their own hands. Lawbreakers on steamboats could be flogged, whipped, or beaten before being placed ashore and left on an island in the river. Some had their heads shaved to brand them as criminals, while others, like Jones, faced hanging or drowning at the hands of the crew. In 1841, for example, Edward Jarvis, who was a traveler on board the Mississippi River on a different steamboat, saw what happened to thieves who crept into staterooms to steal from wealthy passengers. Last night, such a fellow cut open the pantaloons in the pocket of one of them fortunate fellows and tried to get his money, but he was detected, Jarvis later wrote. Yesterday afternoon, two were detected stealing a coat and the captain set them on shore in the wilderness. This is the usual summary judgment and punishment of such fellows, end quote. In another incident on a different boat, three thieves had their heads shaved before being left on an island in the middle of the Mississippi River. They were, however, fortunate to not be on the steamboat Chancellor. In July 1853, as that vessel traveled on the Mississippi River, several thieves were caught and tried on the boat. Five of the men were whipped severely for their crimes. When considering episodes of vigilante justice on steamboats, it quickly becomes apparent that shipboard lynchings and mob rule were simply reflections of cities along the Ohio River. In the 1850s, mob violence occurred in Cincinnati, Louisville, and other river communities. I'm sure most of you, uh, for example, are likely familiar with Bloody Monday, which is pictured here, which were, of course, xenophobic Election Day riots that occurred in Louisville in August of 1855. And this was just a few months before Jones killed Stevens on the Ohio Bell. And on that Election Day in Louisville, members of the American or Know Nothing Party attacked German and Irish citizens to prevent, prevent them from voting. False rumors had spread that these foreign-born residents were hoarding weapons and were stopping Know Nothing supporters from casting ballots. Single incidents of assault quickly exploded into mob violence as gangs ransacked and burned immigrant-owned businesses, breweries, and homes. In the worst episode from what became known as Bloody Monday, Know Nothing rioters burned down Quinn's Row, a set of Irish-owned houses located downtown. Those fleeing the flaming buildings were shot down. Although the true number of casualties is unknown, dozens died in what proved to be Louisville's worst episode of 19th century mob violence. Now, a little more than a year later, Louisville again experienced mob-led vigilante justice. In December of 1856, four members of a white family named Joyce were murdered in their cabin 15 miles from Louisville. Among the victims was a three-year-old child. 
Neighbors searched the area. They found uh, clothing, jewelry, watches, and other items belonging to the Joyce family in an enslaved man's cabin on a nearby farm. After torturing this, the enslaved man, whose name was Bill, Bill confessed and said that he and three other enslaved men had murdered the family. In May of 1857, the four men were tried in Louisville for the murders. Because much of the evidence was uh, circumstantial, the jury actually acquitted the four slaves. However, the, this acquittal was not enough for a large armed mob that had gathered outside the courthouse. They attacked the jail, they actually injured the mayor of Louisville in the fray, and the four acquitted men were eventually turned over to the mob by the jailers who feared for their lives. One of the enslaved men actually had a hidden razor, and this is horrific, but he caught his own throat, or cut his own throat, in order to prevent the mob from murdering him. Uh, the mob then hanged the three other men in the courthouse yard. So therefore, these incidents of mob-led vigilante justice, residents of communities along the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, as well as the passengers and the crew of the Ohio Bell, had firsthand knowledge about mob-driven vigilantism. And again, Bloody Monday had occurred just a few, few months earlier. And when the Mississippian, Jones, killed the boat's clerk, some on board believed that vigilante justice was the appropriate way to punish Jones. Thanks to the actress Matilda Heron, however, Jones was spared from a watery grave. However, that was only temporary. So what happened to the Mississippi murderer, J.B. Jones, on board the Ohio Bell? Now, the captain of the boat, uh, a Louisville native named John Sebastian, tried to leave him in Cairo, Illinois, for trial. However, lawyers there told uh, Sebastian that the courts would likely release Jones because the killing happened outside of their jurisdiction. Captain Sebastian then decided to take Jones to Hickman, Kentucky, for trial. While the boat was docked at Cairo, Sebastian hired an express company to ship the murdered clerk's body to Cincinnati. Three days after Stevens' death, uh, Stevens was buried in Cincinnati's Spring Grove Cemetery. One newspaper wrote that, quote, all the steamers at the Cincinnati Wharf had their flags at half-mast in a token of respect to the deceased. He was an excellent businessman and generally esteemed. A widow and four children survived the murdered man. And that's his, uh, his funeral notice here that talks about uh, Cincinnati and uh, the high respect that he had uh, among other river um, crew members and other river captains at that time. Now, J.B. Jones, however, even though Captain Sebastian had hoped to take him to Hickman, Kentucky, Jones never made it to Hickman, and he never faced trial for murdering the clerk, Hiram Stevens. Instead, the night after the boat left Cairo, Jones disappeared from the Ohio Bell. Although passengers and crew claimed that they did not know what happened to him, his corpse, as I mentioned earlier, was later found bobbing by a sandbar in the Mississippi River tied to a chair. The crew, passengers, or more likely a combination of the two, had extracted their own form of riverine vigilante justice against Jones. There is, however, a, a strong twist in this story. After Jones's corpse was pulled from the river, it was discovered that he wasn't who he said he was. While Jones was from Holly Springs, Mississippi, J.B. Jones was not his real name. Instead, he was on the run from his terrible past, traveling the rivers under an assumed name to avoid justice for another horrific crime. Ironically, a cruel extra legal justice befell him when he committed another crime on board the Ohio Bell. On that steamboat, however, uh, the Mississippian, his name to be revealed, could not run from punishment. Now, although I won't reveal Jones's true identity uh, to you, uh, today, I will cruelly uh, save that for readers of the book. I will tell you what happened to one of the most important characters in my book, the steamboat Ohio Bell. Now, after Stephen's murder, the Ohio Bell continued hauling passengers and freight from Cincinnati to New Orleans. In March of 1860, for example, the steamboat took a load to Cincinnati that included bacon, hams, onions, potatoes, cheese, candles, sausages, whiskey, tobacco, and plows, and uh, many more items. And that gives you an idea of, of the amount of goods that these steamboats uh, hauled during the uh, 19th century. As we know, however, sectional te tensions between the North and South over slavery soon disrupted this profitable trade. And again, we're, we're looking at 1860, 1861. Now, when the Civil War erupted and the secession crisis was going on, the Ohio Bell continued to haul freight and people up and down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. Although the Bell was an Ohio-owned boat, by the time Louisiana and other states in the Deep South had seceded from the Union, the vessel still delivered passengers and goods to New Orleans. And for me, this is a, a really fascinating part of the secession crisis. 
the state seceded from the Union, these northern owned boats like the Ohio Bell continued to travel up and down the rivers, stopping at southern ports. By April 1861, of course, this travel became problematic. On April 15th, the Bell was docked at Evansville, Indiana, loading freight for another trip down to New Orleans. Three days earlier, however, Southern forces in South Carolina had fired on the Union garrison at Fort Sumter and Charleston Harbor. The fort surrendered the next day. While the Bell waited at Evansville, still uh, loading up freight, waiting for passengers, President Abraham Lincoln called for 75,000 troops to crush the rebellion. Texas had seceded in February, joining Louisiana and six other states. And after Lincoln's call for soldiers um, pushed Virginia, or well, Lincoln's call for soldiers, those 75,000 men, then pushed Virginia to leave the Union on April 17th. Arkansas, North Carolina, and Tennessee soon followed. Despite the fractured Union, and despite being uh, owned uh, by Ohioans, the Bell continued its voyage southward, reaching New Orleans on April 21st. Now, although the trip down river was initially peaceful, when the boat unloaded freight at New Orleans, the, uh, the crew found themselves swept up in the national conflict. Upstream, secessionists in Memphis had blocked the Mississippi River, and pro-Confederate residents in Memphis knew that the Ohio Bell and other northern-owned boats were soon leaving New Orleans uh, to make their return journey northward and home. Uh, these uh, uh, Memphis secessionists vowed to seize these northern-owned vessels for the good of the South. Now, at this time, uh, Unionists and secessionists up and down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers were really playing a game of retribution. You seize my property, and I'll take yours. And in May 1861, residents of Cairo, Illinois, confiscated $175,000 worth of weapons bound for Tennessee when they captured the Southern steamer C.E. Hillman. And that would represent today millions of dollars in uh, weapons and arms. Now, in response, secessionists planned to detain the Ohio Bell and other northern-owned vessels um, until reparations were made. And after leaving New Orleans, the Ohio Bell stopped at Napoleon, Arkansas, uh, to pick up wood. And for most of these boats, um, their furnaces were, were fueled by wood, and they would stop at different wood yards up and down the river. So the Ohio Bell stopped in Napoleon, Arkansas, and several weeks earlier, Cincinnati residents had seized arms, ammunition, and four cannons that had been intended for secessionist forces in Arkansas. Now, that state's governor, Henry M. Rector, who is pictured here, uh, of course, was, was furious, and Governor Rector blamed the confiscation on, quote, the people of Cincinnati having instinctive proclivities toward public plunder, end quote. Now, determined to avenge this insult, Rector ordered Arkansas troops to snatch all Cincinnati-owned steamboats, including the Ohio Bell. And when the boat arrived at Napoleon, armed secessionists seized the vessel. Now, the Ohio Bell was now in Southern hands. The Confederate military um, uh, basically sent the crew packing home, and they ended up using the boat as a troop transport, a hospital ship, and as a scouting vessel, going up and down many, many different Western rivers. At least once, they also used the boat to transport enslaved African Americans across the Mississippi River. Now, the bell remained in Confederate hands for new nearly a year. In March 1862, however, a Union flotilla attacked Island Number 10 near New Madrid, Missouri. When the Ohio Bell appeared in front of the flotilla, a Union gunboat fired on the bell and drove the vessel away. A reporter on board one of the Union gunboats wrote that, quote, a steamer was seen coming up the river from the island. Nearer and nearer she approaches us until we can read her name, Ohio Bell, painted in large letters upon her wheelhouse. The saucy craft continues her course and rounds the point in full view of our whole fleet. Our gunboat fires at her and she instantly puts about and goes down the river like a scared deer, nor ever stops until her smoke pipes are lost to view among the heavy timber upon the head of the island, end quote. And I wonder how much these Union uh, gunners noted the irony that a, uh, a boat called the Ohio Bell was actually scouting for the Confederates at that point. Now, after the Battle of Island Number 10, um, the Confederates actually tried to scuttle uh, the steamboat. They knocked giant holes uh, in the bottom of the craft and sent it uh, floating down the, the Mississippi River, but um, it ended up coming ashore and Union soldiers, including several who were former steamboat operators, actually went down into the hull and uh, patched the boat and managed to raise it and, and essentially save the Ohio Bell. So Union troops, after that battle, recaptured the vessel and although the boat's owners demanded that the Ohio Bell be returned to them, the federal government refused to hand it over. 
Instead, instead the Bell uh, began a long career serving the Union Army. So again, uh, during the Civil War, uh, this Ohio-owned vessel served both sides during the Civil War. For the next several years, the Bell transported Confederate prisoners, Union soldiers, and acted as a hospital ship. And we know that multiple sick soldiers died from illness on the boat, and uh, most of these men were simply wrapped in blankets or sheets and were uh, buried in the river. So uh, sad funeral services uh, for them indeed on board the Ohio Bell. On one voyage, the steamboat took troops on a mission of retribution. In September 1862, after Confederate guerrillas fired on a Union supply ship from Randolph, Tennessee, Union General William T. Sherman ordered Randolph, Tennessee to be burned as a punishment for harboring guerrillas. The Bell transported Union soldiers to the town. As the steamboat neared the shore, one Buckeye soldier wrote, the quiet citizens began to scamper like rats from a foundering vessel. Oh, but they did run. He added that the whole town felt their impending doom and were satisfied that though it was just, it was although hard. Now the Union troops uh, who embarked off the Ohio Bell then laid the town to waste, burning all the buildings except for the Methodist Church. And approximately 60 homes were put to the torch. And um, essentially the, uh, the Union Army left the church because it was a religious structure, it was a house of worship, but also they wanted to show that a town uh, did once exist here. And that's what happened when your community harbored guerrillas up and down the rivers. In October 1863, the Union military determined that smaller boats like the Bell were no longer needed for the Union war effort. Authorities then returned the Ohio Bell to its owners, who eventually received about $19,000 for the boat service to the federal government. According to one estimate I found, uh, $19,000 in 1863 would be worth nearly $600,000 today. So I'm sure that the, uh, uh, the owners of the Bell were, were quite pleased um, to finally get payment from the federal government for the use of the boat. Now, the vessel, uh, once it was returned to its owners, immediately began returning uh, to running trade between Cincinnati and New Orleans, which by May 1862 had fallen back under Union control. So although the Bell was again delivering freight along the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, um, the boat did occasionally transport Union troops. Now again, you have an Ohio-owned boat traveling up and down the Ohio and the Mississippi rivers, um, going to New Orleans from Cincinnati, and New Orleans at that time was under Union control, so they were still delivering passengers and freight essentially through war zones. And they were frequently reminded that they were um, uh, steaming through dangerous territory. In March 1864, for example, there was a 74-year-old man who lived on the Tennessee side of the Mississippi River near New Madrid, and he boarded the boat. He was bleeding profusely from wounds um, to his arm and his hand. And the man told the crew members of the Ohio Bell that he and three of his neighbors were out chopping wood when a bunch of uh, pro-Confederate uh, guerrillas appeared and ended up killing his three companions. Um, the man said that the guerrillas called him a damned old abolitionist. And they then shot him in the arm and hand. Um, the man ran off despite being wounded, despite being over 70 years old, and he reputedly crawled for safety until he reached the river and he managed to flag down uh, the Ohio Bell. And uh, the crew rescued him and the boat's captain treated him generously, it was said, and a Union surgeon on board actually dressed the man's wound. Again, it was a stark reminder to the crew um, that they were actually in dangerous territory. This happened again several months later when two Union soldiers on board were actually severely injured when guerrillas fired at the boat. Now, the ultimate fate of the Ohio Bell mirrored that of the entire steamboat industry. After the Civil War, the use of steamboats continued to decline as railroad lines expanded. And this was a death knell for the Ohio Bell, which by the end of the conflict was an aged vessel. Uh, furthermore, because the boat had really spent the war years as a soldier's transport that also carried sick and wounded men, the boat was surely in rough shape at the end of the conflict. So the Ohio Bell was no longer in the luxurious condition of its uh, former pre-war self. Now, the federal government at one point actually bought the Bell back uh, from its owners, but in the late summer of 1865, an advertisement appeared in newspapers noting a large government sale of steamboats, wharf boats, barges, and other property. And dozens of federal vessels that were used during the Civil War were sold at New Orleans, including the side-wheeled steamer Ohio Bell, which they said, as you can see here, was registered 300 tons. And this is a copy of, of, that, uh, of that article. So the Quartermaster General's Department in Washington, D.C. Was, was essentially getting rid of um, um, unnecessary federal property. They took sealed uh, bids for all these boats for a number of months. And then the Ohio Bell was finally sold um, 
in New Orleans to parties in Alabama for $6,250, which was a far cry from her estimated value of $20,000 from just a year earlier. Again, a lot of these boats that were roughly used um, were being, being sold off. You can see several of them here, the wharf boat Natchez, the steamer uh, J.M. Brown, another steamer. So again, by this time, you know, these boats were all in very rough shape and uh, the prices had, had dropped considerably. Now the steamboat's name, the Ohio Bell, would not survive the sale. Upon being sold, uh, the boat was actually renamed the Alabama Bell, and it then traveled the Alabama River, transporting goods and people to Mobile, Montgomery, and other landings. So I think it was probably uh, fairly uh, savvy of the boat's owners uh, to change the name to the Alabama Bell. I don't know how well a, a boat named after a northern state, the Ohio Bell, uh, would have done uh, ferrying passengers and uh, freight um, in Alabama in 1865. Well, in September of 1866, the Ohio Bell and the Alabama Bell was sold again, and newspapers ran a notice stating, capitalists and steamboat men should take note, because an auction house was selling the fine steamboat Alabama Bell with all her tackle, apparel, and furniture in complete order. The newspaper added that, quote, is a safe and profitable investment she will no doubt prove invaluable, and the sale should be well attended. Now, sadly, the bell did not survive long after the auction. In 1867, after a miraculous 12-year run on the Mississippi, Ohio, and other rivers, the steamboat was broken up and it was like, likely sold for scrap. As her boilers and boards were taken away, and as the windows and wheels of the Ohio bell were dismantled, one wonders if those pulling her apart knew her history, and if they knew the tales of murder and desperate men who once rode on board the Grand Ohio Bell. Uh, thank you so much for having me uh, here. Um, I'll be happy to uh, answer, answer any questions you all might have. St Stuart, I'll start with this question. Well, actually with two. Um, it's very interesting how an author finds a topic to write about. What led you to this wonderful story? So I was actually working, I'm still working on a book about a duel that was fought during the Civil War between a Union colonel and a secessionist civilian. And um, um, at the time, sort of Southern honor in the duel uh, was very much on my mind. And those of you who are fans of, you know, uh, the musical Hamilton will probably appreciate this. But um, I, was, I was doing research and, and happened to be going through this 1856 newspaper. I literally just found a small notice that said that um, a drowned man was pulled out of the, uh, off a sandbar in the Mississippi River tied to a chair. And I thought, you know, what is the story about? What could have happened? So as I started digging more and more into this, I realized that, you know, it went beyond sort of being a mere murder. That there was a Southern honor component to it because, again, J.B. Jones, this drunken Mississippian, was completely insulted when this lower class clerk uh, manhandled him out of the um, out of the cabin. In addition, the clerk had claimed that the money was um, um, counterfeit. So he was basically telling this Mississippian, um, not only are you a liar, which insulted him and, and burned his honor, but then he manhandled him out, impugning his manhood. And so in this Mississippian's mind, this was the only thing he could do. And, and during the, during the uh, mid 19th century, Mississippians were actually, um, um, Mississippi was sort of known as a, a fairly rough uh, state in terms of violence among the upper classes. In 1838, um, there was a famous case in Louisville where three Mississippians who were getting uh, fitted um, for, a, for wedding suits actually murdered a tailor in Louisville. And one of the prosecutors in that case was noted attorney Ben Hardin, who's from Nelson County. And Ben Hardin called these men um, the Bowie Knife and Pistol Gentry. And it's a, it's a great line that really well summarizes a lot of these people, men like J.B. Jones. So again, I was working on this book about a duel that I'm hoping to get wrapped up soon. Um, so Southern Honor was sort of on my mind and, and this just sort of, uh, this topic just kind of fell, fell in my lap in that sense. Well, after it fell into your lap, how long did it take you to do the research, the writing? <clears throat> can, you all, can you describe for us the, the actual work process that went behind this? Sure. It's, it's um, unfortunately in this story, there are not a ton of, um, of, of legal records, for example, in the case. Um, the captain of the trial, John Sebastian, was actually, um, was actually charged with murder in this case. Um, authorities felt like they had to do something about J.B. Jones, uh, which was, of course was not his real name, um, but they had to do something about this murder. So they ended up charging uh, Sebastian with murder. He was acquitted 
but I really tried to find, you know, court cases of this. So I, I ended up really relying fairly heavily on, uh, on uh, newspaper accounts of this. So I was able to sort of patch together the story in that way. So um, much to my regret, there were not a lot of uh, legal documents that were still existing. But fortunately, um, newspapers were so shocked by the crime that they ended up reporting on it um, uh, quite widely. Um, the newspaper coverage of the story is something I examined in this book as well, because initially when J.B. Jones was found murdered, newspapers said, oh, he, you know, what a terrible killer. He's one of these terrible desperados who rides up and down the, the river on these steamboats. Um, he murdered this poor clerk. Yet when they found out he was indeed a, a man of property and was indeed uh, the son of a wealthy planner, the, the tenor of these newspaper articles really changed. And a lot of them, especially those located sort of near Mississippi, started talking about how the clerk basically had it coming. I um, mean, you know, they put their own sort of uh, turn of honor on the story and said, oh, he, he never should have manhandled this uh, prominent man of property out of the cabin. And so they essentially shifted the blame uh, from the, you know, um, um, lower class clerk um, or is it, they took it away from the wealthy Mississippian and put it on this lower class clerk. And that was something that was very interesting, too, because, you know, today we worry about does wealth actually influence media coverage? You know, it did in, in the mid 19th century as well, because these uh, newspapers around Memphis, especially, were still trying to impress the family of this murdered man. Um, in terms of how long the book took, um, probably well over a year and a half, I would guess. Um, you know, I've, uh, I'd already been sort of peeling the onion of Southern honor culture with that other book. So, you know, I had a lot of good resources at my fingertips at that point. Well, then here's one. Um, did most steamboats with passengers in the 1800s have gambling rooms? They did. Actually, a lot did. And the Ohio Bell did as well. And uh, um, there was a noted gambler named George Duvall who was on board and uh, would, would play three-card money quite a bit. And actually, he wrote a memoir that was, became – you know, sort of a pulp memoir that became pretty famous um, in the 1850s about his life up and down the river. And George Duvall talks about how uh, um, he was winning a lot of money on the Ohio Bell until the, uh, the captain of the boat, John Sebastian, came up and wanted to, to try his hand at gambling and uh, bet a substantial sum of money and lost it. And the captain then became angry and uh, shut down the game. So it's sort of the captain's discretion um, but uh, Duvall actually let the captain win back his money, which, uh, uh, and then the captain, of course, reopened the game, and uh, Duvall took money from more suckers, as he called it. And one man actually uh, uh, lost, I think, $5,000 in one game, and Duvall commented that the man uh, lost his supper soon after that. He became physically ill for having lost all of his money to this uh, gambler, George Duvall. So yeah, you know, steamboats were these interesting sort of crucibles of, of, of culture at the time. You had gambling, you had a lot of alcohol on board, you had uh, men, you know, with, with concealed weapons. And one thing I, I, I talk about in the book, there was a, a straw poll that was taken during a couple of presidential elections on the boat, and there were many, many states represented. I mean, there were people from you know, well over 15 or 20 states on board at that one time. So, um, you know, it's, it's really surprising how, how cultures were mixed um, on these steamboats. And, and again, how occasionally, you know, Southern honor culture rubbed up against uh, Northerners who didn't share that same sensibility. And in the case of the Ohio Bell, it had disastrous results. We're, <clears throat> if you are looking at the Ohio and the Mississippi rivers, can you talk to us a bit about how those were really the, the super highways of the nation at the time? Right. It, you know, if it weren't for, Manifest Destiny and the Ohio River completely went hand in hand. And you can see the, the growth of these cities like Louisville and Cincinnati um, as the steamboat era developed. And in Louisville, for example, one thing that helped Louisville immensely was, as you all know, was the creation of the Portland Canal in the early 1830s. And that really, which it, it opened up um, uh, trade to, basically unfettered trade to, to New Orleans, um, which was incredible for Louisville. And after that, Louisville just exploded in terms of, of population and businesses growing. And, and Cincinnati was the same way. Cincinnati has been called sort of the central focus point of, of the steamboat industry um, um, on the Ohio River. And of course, you know, pork packing was a, a massive uh, business for Cincinnati and, and really helped spur um, the growth of a lot of communities on the Ohio River. Now, New Albany, Indiana actually had um, some major steamboat um, uh, shipbuilding 
centers. And uh, I think some papers at the Filson actually actually delve into that. And I'm fortunate to have done some uh, steamboat research at the Filson and have um, been able to take advantage of your wonderful collection there. And, and uh, it's really incredible. And I encourage anybody to go, if you, if you have any interest in this, to go to the Filson uh, once COVID is over and, uh, and, and, and take a look at these wonderful archives that are in there. But you're exactly right. I mean, you know, steam travel created super highways on the, the Ohio, then once the Portland Canal opened up, um, you know, all the way down to New Orleans. And so you had this amazing trade that went on really until um, even past, uh, you know, in the 1880s when railroads were, were essentially king, there were still steamboats that were running up and down the rivers. So uh, it's, 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 I find it fairly fascinating. Well, you've gone out of your way to compliment the Filson, but I'd like to compliment the Kentucky Historical Society. Oh, thanks. In that I've spent um, many times over the last five years researching uh, someone that I'm writing about there because most of the papers on the Madison Johnson's family are at KHS. Right. And those that aren't at KHS are either at Transylvania uh, or uh, at University of Kentucky, Margaret King Special Collections. Right. Library. So that I, I guess I've, as an amateur, um, I've gotten the, the fun of finding out just what the archives are in this state and they're formidable. And you add to that all the lawsuit records, the actual suits themselves over at the Kentucky Department of Archives and Library. Right. It's, man, it's a smorgasbord of delights. Um, go back though, if you would, to sure. this whole idea of Southern honor, the honor culture, uh, recently, Elizabeth and I watched the movie, I told you this before we got gone on, 12 Years a Slave. Right. And there, you know, the, the, the action took place largely in Louisiana. But there was much of that same honor culture portrayed. Uh, and it filtered down from the highest economic class of uh, white individuals to the lowest. Uh, just in different in all ugly forms. What what lessons do can we learn now um, from what you've written about? Well, you know, I think one important thing is that sadly violence has always been used as a means of of conflict resolution, yeah. and I think uh, uh, that's something we need to be aware of. I mean, again, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, when alcohol and concealed weapons mixed on board uh, the Ohio Bell uh, and many, many other steamboats, tragedy resulted. And, you know, in Kentucky in recent years, um, you now don't need a concealed carry permit for, to carry a handgun, for example. So, you know, are we, are we stepping back to an earlier era? And of course, um, I think we're fortunate that, I would guess the sort of levels of violence are actually less in society now. I think I've seen uh, uh, statistical st studies that show that. But, you know, are we endangering ourselves by sort of taking the step back to a time where, um, you know, people roamed armed, and then, you know, when you throw gambling and alcohol into the mix, it, it, it causes a lot of problems. But, you know, honor killings still exist. I mean, you know, every year in, in, in Pakistan, for example, we read newspaper articles about um, honor killings that have happened in families. And so I think a lot of these themes um, uh, still resound with us today, um, which, is, which is sad, really. So we still have interpersonal violence. Honor killings still exist. Um, but, you know, to me, uh, what I find sort of enlightening about this story is that, you know, you can take one small episode and you can use that as the lens through which to examine a number of other important themes that are important to today. And that's one thing I found, you know, you talk about that thrill of discovery in the archives. That's one thing that really excited me as I went on and, and really kind of rolled my sleeves up and dug into this story too. Stuart, here's a, a, a question. Um, sure. What ended up happening to the members of the crew on the Ohio Bell when the boat was captured during the Civil War? Did right. they make it back to Ohio? Right. Again, uh, um, was Ohio that safe a place to make it back to? It was for these men. And essentially what happened was when the boat got grabbed in Napoleon, Arkansas, um, uh, the secessionists who had threatened the boat with not only rifle fire and musketry fire, but also with a cannon that they rolled down to the shore, um, the Ohio Bell surrendered. They then ejected the crew. And fortunately, there was a Southern boat, a, a Southern owned boat that was actually um, came by Napoleon at that time. And they ended up taking 
uh, the crew up to uh, St. Louis. So they were, were sent back home essentially during the secession crisis, but they had to leave the boat. And um, eventually they made it back to their respective homes. You know, these river workers were a, a, a fairly um, um, interesting lot who lived in varying places, who didn't have homes sometimes, who just you know, essentially lived on the boat. So they all basically scattered. But John Sebastian, who I mentioned earlier, who's the boat's captain, he was also a partial owner of the Ohio Bell, and he fell into a deep rage. He was a Louisville native. He'd moved to Cincinnati. And when the Ohio Bell became captured by um, secessionists, he then joined the Union Army and eventually became a, uh, a pilot on the steamboat, the A.O. Tyler, which had been converted into a, uh, a gunboat. And um, they took this, the Union Army took the steamboat, they covered it with white oak planks that were about four or five inches thick. Um, loaded weapons on it and then used it as a, a gunboat. And, and in uh, the summer of 1862 on the Yazoo River near Vicksburg, um, the Tyler, the Queen of the West, and a number of other Union-owned boats ended up getting in a horrific firefight um, with an ironclad gunboat that the Confederates had called the Arkansas. And in that fray, Captain Sebastian, uh, again, this Louisville native, the captain of the Ohio Bell, who was piloting the A.O. Tyler, was actually um, uh, lost his arm in that fight. And so after uh, that battle was over, he returned home uh, with one arm, um, uh, was sort of forced out of the military service because of that, but he continued to recruit for um, the Union Army and especially the, the naval forces that were running these steamboats. Um, after the war, he actually became a treasurer of Hamilton County, Ohio, uh, which is at Cincinnati, which was a very lucrative post at the time. And um, when his wife died, he became incredibly dejected and his family ended up moving to Emporia, Kansas. And out there in Kansas, uh, Sebastian, again, this sort of one-armed former steamboat man became a, uh, uh, a massive a cattle baron and uh, invested heavily in railroads. So he still had his eye on transportation. And what I love about his story, um, there was a massive fire that swept through Emporia and he and another man uh, waited calmly while the flames sort of started coming toward this, this one uh, um, uh, general store that Sebastian was guarding. And, 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 you know, they were sort of waiting for the fire to spread so they could pull out any goods that the, the general store um, owner had in there. But, you know, he met it completely calmly. And you figure, you know, the man had spent his entire life since age 15 piloting a steamboat down the Mississippi and Ohio River, sort of dodging snags, dodging other boats, you know, on stormy nights, on foggy nights. So, you know, there was nothing that was going to shake John Sebastian. So a massive fire was probably a little, little worry to him. But um, the rest of the crew members scattered during the Civil War. Um, but Sebastian most certainly had the most sort of harrowing and interesting tale. Uh, for those of you who just heard a barking dog in the background, I <laughs> apologize. I could say don't pay any attention to that, docking bar that barking dog behind the curtain. That's our 13-year-old lamb. Um, Mine is, mine's locked upstairs. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, I get it. Um, here is something from Kathy to everyone, and she's absolutely right. Another good resource would be the Howard Steamboat Museum just over in Jeffersonville. Right. We're so lucky to have that. And then another comment, uh, one more comment. I love, this is from Dennis Jennings to everyone. I love visiting the Perryville Battlefield, which is near and dear to your heart. Right. Uh, the history of that battle in the community is so interesting, and indeed it is. It is, you know, Kentucky's largest Civil War battle. Um, I actually worked there for 10 years as uh, director of the Battlefield Preservation Association. And Battlefield, there, I mean, it's, it's now become, for those of you interested in historic preservation, the Perryville Battlefield is a national model for historic preservation now. And in the mid 1990s, only 98 acres of the battlefield were preserved. It's since grown to close to 1,100 acres of preserved land. And, you know, during this time of COVID, if you love history, if you love Kentucky history and Civil War history specifically, it's a wonderful place to go and tromp around. They have, I think, well over 15 miles of moan uh, interpretive trails now. Um, so it's just, it's a, it's a wonderful, special place, uh, very much near and dear to my heart. Uh, and then the last question. How often did these steamboats embark on the journey from Cincinnati to New Orleans? And how long would this type of journey usually take? Right, and that's a great question. And the first part of that question is- who asked that question is very smart, I can tell you. <laughs> well, it, it's interesting because um, there, were, there were a number of, they were called packet lines um, that were developed and the Ohio Bell was part of the packet line. And what that was, it was typically, um, a, a packet line would include a number of steamboats that were owned by the same company 
that would leave for a specific destination at a specific time. So the packet lines first were the first people who really organized steamboat travel. And so you'd have the Ohio Bell leaving, heading southward to New Orleans, while at, the, while at the same time, another boat was leaving New Orleans to head back to Cincinnati that was owned by the same company. And so, you know, the idea was you constantly had boats going up and down the river, stopping at these ports, leaving at specific times, so the traveling public and people loading freight would know um, when it was time to load either people or um, goods on board. And it took actually the Ohio Bell going down river, it took roughly 20 days to make the journey. And so that included stops in Evansville, Cairo, and um, really a number of points in between. And also stops, as I mentioned earlier, it stops at wood yards, where they would uh, simply stop and load fuel on board to continue the journey. So, you know, typically a three week, three week journey. And, uh, uh, you know, again, sometimes very harrowing, as I mentioned before, you know, um, one fifth of all boats would either burn or explode. Um, so sometimes you were taking your life in your hands when you traveled on, on steamboats. Stuart, thank you so, so much. This was, this really was fun. And this has been fun. It has been fun. I've really enjoyed it. And the other thing that I love is that we publish this journal at the Filson in conjunction with the Cincinnati History Museum and the University of Cincinnati, the Ohio right. History Journal. And this really fits into the whole theme of the travel up and down this magnificent, beautiful waterway. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And again, to everyone, you know, if you're not a member of the Filson, um, it's a wonderful organization. I'd really encourage you to, to join and, and uh, yeah. think of other historical you're, organizations too. So if you're not a member of the Kentucky Historical right. <laughs> Society, I urge you to join as well. Right. Well, thank you, Dick. I really appreciate you all having me and thanks to the, you know, generosity of your staff too. Uh, they've been great to work with. So thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Bye everybody. Come back. We'll see you soon.